Welcome, INSEAD friends and colleagues. My name is Paul Sanders. I have the pleasure of uh, hosting the Dorio Distinguished Speaker Series. One of the first Dorio speakers who I got to host uh, two, two years ago in March 2017 is uh, Sir Andrew Large, who's, who's back again uh, tonight. Thank you for, for coming along. Um, some of you might recall that uh, Andrew addressed us on the topic of financial stability and international standards at a time when uh, the UK had just voted uh, for Brexit and at a time when uh, a new president had just uh, entered the White House. So a fairly interesting time to be talking about uh, international financial stability. The reason for this little anecdote is uh, that I have a little secret about the Dorio series that I want to share tonight, which is that I always ask the current Dorio speaker who, in an ideal world, they would like to hear from next. So, Paul, I will <laughs> pick you up on that later just to get your ideas on who you'd like to who you'd like to hear next. Sir Andrew put Paul Marshall at the top of the list, explaining at the time that while they don't agree on absolutely everything, um, that Paul would be a wonderful speaker. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that Paul has uh, accepted our invitation and is here with us tonight. Many of you will know Paul Marshall as the CIO and chairman of Marshall Waste, a uh, global hedge fund uh, located here, headquartered here in, the, in, in London. However, few are probably aware of Paul's massive contribution to education uh, and to philanthropy. He's a founding trustee of ARC, the children's charity, and chairman of ARC Schools, the leading academy provider. He's founder and chairman of the Education Policy Institute, a think tank that launched in 2005. He's the author of several books on the topic of education, The Tale, How Britain Schools Fail One Child in Five, Tackling Educational Inequality, and Aiming Higher, A Better Future for England's Schools. In 2015, he co-founded the Marshall Institute for Philanthropy and Social Entrepreneurship at the LSE. And this aims to uh, improve the impact and effectiveness of private philanthropy. Paul served as the, non, as the lead non-executive director at the Department of Education from 2013 to 2016. Paul was knighted in Her Majesty's birthday honours list in 2000 and... Catching up with my notes here. Um, in 2016. <laughs> Do you remember, Paul? <laughs> uh, and uh, for his services to education and philanthropy. Of course, he holds an MBA from INSEAD um, and uh, also studied at St John's College in Oxford University. Paul tonight's going to address us on the topic of business as a force for good, what they didn't teach us at business school. The first part of the presentation, so Paul's presentation, will be video recorded, um, but the Q&A after that um, is completely off the record. Um, so please uh, join me in welcoming Paul to the stage. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I, I've written this down, so I'm going to be reading, which I, I prefer to be walking around the stage, but on this occasion, I've actually did a little bit of preparation, and, uh, and I, because I thought it was a lecture, I, I thought it was a lecture series. It's it's not, so I've kind of thought about it as a lecture, so forgive me if it gets slightly serious at a certain point. So I, I um, first of all, to say thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very honored. Andrew Large, there's a bit of kind of cronyism or nepotism there, because Andrew is the chairman of the Marshall Waste Advisory Committee. Uh, so he's been a very close uh, collaborator of us in the, uh, over the years, helping us build our business. Um, and um, Deutsche Bank, I don't think there are any, I gather there are, the Deutsche Bank, they've all left, is that right? Right, there's nobody here, oh, there's one person. <laughs> Thank you for hosting us. Um, and Deutsche Bank, um, I'm actually quite familiar with this room and with this building because we've flogged quite a few things uh, to Deut through this room to, to people in Deutsche Bank. Um, part of the reason they got such a big balance sheet. Um, the, uh, but, I, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. And, and um, we, um, or INSEAD was one of the happiest years of my life. I was there in 1985. There are some three very good friends of mine from that, from that cohort here, uh, and um, uh, I met my wife uh, in that year. Not she wasn't in this year. We met at a party at the uh, Chateau bois le -Vent. Um and uh, we've been very happily married for over 30 years, and we lived in the Auberge de Reclose, if, any, if that's still, anybody know that still? We had, yeah, we had an Austerlitz party there 
in December 1984, when everybody dressed up in Napoleonic uniforms. Um, so anyway, it was, it was one of the best years of my life, um, and I look back on it very fondly. Uh, no, but I'm going to talk about um, business as a force for good, um, and I have quite strong feelings about it, but it, uh, uh, which will hopefully come through uh, in the text. Um, I'd like to open with a confession. I used to be a disciple of Milton Friedman. There it is, it's out there. I've, I've said it. Um, when I started in the investment management business, in, which is 1985, the after in INSEAD, Milton Friedman was all the rage. In 1970, he published his famous letter to the New York Times, where he said that the social responsibility of business was to make profits, and specifically to quote, to make as much money as possible whilst conforming to the basic rules of society, both those embodied in law and those embodied in ethical custom. Friedman's doctrine steadily gained ground in the US in the 1970s, the fashion came to Europe in the 1980s, and the particular angle that appealed to fund managers like me was that the executives of the business should be rewarded like owners in order to make them think like owners. A core part of my dialogue with the management of almost every company I met at that time, and I basically was toing and froing between London and continental Europe, uh, was to make sure that their incentives were aligned with those of their shareholders. Were they rewarded with equity? Could they access enough equity to make a difference to the way they behaved? At the time, there was a sufficient number of companies where there was not a proper link to the equity, so this persistent dialogue made some sense. But what I did not anticipate at all at the time was that the system of LTIPs and corporate pay would become so abused through a combination of financial engineering, manipulation of the share count, and central bank support for stock markets, nor that the Friedmanite model would become a system of, enri of enrichment for the corporate executive class, taking the ratio of CEO, US CEO pay for, to the average worker from 20 to 1 in 1965 to 440 to 1 today. What started out as a radical idea in 1970 became an orthodoxy, and then latterly became abused as an orthodoxy, so that whatever was good in the original idea, and the alignment of incentives is a good idea, was lost. In the 1980s, I was effectively an adherent to this orthodoxy, the slave, if you like, of a defunct economist. The reason I tell this story is that we are all, to varying degrees, slaves to orthodoxies. You could go as far as to say that we all work inside our own maze, like the mice in the book, Who Moved My Cheese? The maze is not of our making, but we all accept most of its values and structures as inherently good and normal. And so, as we think about the role of business in society, I want to focus on the orthodoxies which enslave us and which prevent business fulfilling its true potential as a force for good. First, before I start criticizing the business world, a heads up, I operate inside the maze. I'm a huge beneficiary of the system. I built my business with my partners at Marshall Ways to profit from the system, and there are certain hedge fund practices, which people in this, not everybody in this room, uh, would necessarily approve. We are active traders. Some people here uh, might disapprove of that. Deutsche Bank wouldn't. Um, we are active short sellers. Uh, in 2008, the Archbishop of York dismissed short sellers of UK banks as no better than bank robbers. I disagree, but uh, that's another debate. Uh, and thirdly, we are amply rewarded for what we do. Some would say, many would say, most would say, over-rewarded. Indeed, one definition I've heard of the hedge fund industry is a fee structure in search of a client. Um, so, but, having said that, got that out of the way, what are the orthodoxies that modern businesses are a slave to, or modern business? I'm going to talk about three. First of all, uh, what you might call the foundational orthodoxies. In the world of ideas, it can sometimes be useful to go right upstream to the source. And I would like to start with the ideas and assumptions which we all imbibed at business school, our theories of change, if you like. 
The theory of change which I was exposed to at business school was entirely based around financial capital. There was virtually nothing about human capital, nothing about social capital, and nothing about environmental capital. I understand this is gradually changing, and INSEAD is leading the way, I think, in some respects, and particularly with Andre Hoffman's new institute, but change is slow. I believe we need to challenge the foundations of everything we learnt at business school. Even within the narrow foundation or narrow study of financial capital, the theory of change is all wrong. The economics profession has largely been going down what the French would call a faux piste since shortly after Adam Smith. Indeed, I can think of no other walk of life where there is such a complete disconnect between theory and practice. Basically, for the, for the convenience of the academic world, most academic economic theory has been built on simplifying and therefore falsifying axioms. The first such axiom is that people act on the basis of rational self-interest. This is based on a misreading of Adam Smith. People are not rational, as one glance at Twitter will tell you, and they do not act simply on the basis of self-interest. Humans operate partially on self-interest, but we are also altru altruistic, cooperative, idealistic. We are social beings. We seek a sense of purpose. The other not uh, most notorious falsifying axiom is that markets are efficient. Efficient market theory has its origins, I'm afraid to say, in France, the source of most good art and most bad ideas. It started, it started with Leon Valras, who laid the foundations of equilibrium theory. Then we had Louis Bachelier, who in 1900 developed random walk theory, which was the basis. It was then readopted by the Chicago School in the 1960s, Eugene Farmer and Friends and became the central economic orthodoxy of markets and business schools. In the last 20 years or so, behavioral economics has at last reconnected economics with empirical as opposed to rationalist and axiomatic thinking. And for the first time in two centuries, we have things coming out of the economics profession which make sense to market practitioners. But in the meantime, this axiomatic thinking has infected the economics profession. It has infected our business schools, including INSEAD, who teach a theory of change and theories of management based on these axioms. It has infected remuneration policy. It has infected competition policy through the work of Robert Bork in the United States. And it lies at the foundation of the whole edifice of institutions, the IMF, the OECD, central banks, the World Bank. Some have called them the acronymiat, which holds sway over international business. The second orthodoxy, and this leads me to it, is what I would call the Davos orthodoxy. You can now almost write the Davos man's speech with your eyes shut. It starts with an encomium to all the achievements of global capitalism, to the lifting of two billion people out of poverty, to the improvements in life expectancy, sanitation, education, and healthcare. Then it admits that there are a few externalities and unwanted side effects, Inequality gets a brief mention, along with diversity. But the key focus, the focus is sustainability and the environment, and we will, will invariably hear a claim for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I can tell you, I've watched quite a few INSEAD speeches. That's pretty much the, the pattern in those speeches too. What rarely gets a mention, let alone deep examination, is the way that global capitalism has uprooted rural and provincial communities in the West, the way it has led to the flatlining of Western living standards, the devastation of the high street, and the decay of old industrial towns from Detroit to Stoke. To the extent that Davos man tries to understand these issues, it is largely out of the fear of rising populism that may endanger the, state, endanger the status quo of their mountaintop summits. Davos man is much keener about the environment than the community. Why is that? Firstly, because the environment plays to the globalist agenda. Talk of the environment allows you to fly to a mountain comfort top for a conference with other globalists and wring your hands in comfort. In January, 1,500 private jets flew to Davos to hear David Attenborough talk about global warming. <laughs> How much more satisfying is it to wring your hands about the ozone layer with other billionaires and bankers than to grapple with the gritty problems of the poor communities on your doorstep 
devastated by Amazon and the opioid epidemic. And of course, the other reason the business elite prefer to talk about the environment is that it is commercially synergistic. It is helpful to your brand to talk about fair trade and ethical products, to offer plastic-free drinking straws, <coughs> organic fruit and vegetables, plastic-free chewing gum, whatever that is, lunar pads, beeswax-coated cloth wraps, biodegradable trash bags, rechargeable batteries, solar-powered phone chargers. On the other hand, it is so much harder for the bottom line if you have to worry about whether you are paying your people enough or whether you are doing enough for the communities you are displacing. I'm not saying that capitalism is not a miracle of human invention and progress, nor am I saying that we should not be concerned about the environment. What I'm saying is that Davos represents a globalist orthodoxy, almost an ideology, which largely ignores many of the most difficult problems closest to home and closest to our homes. Those problems are inconvenient for the elite globalist elites. They are difficult and expensive to solve. The third orthodoxy is what you might call the soft corporatist orthodoxy. Capitalism has a natural tendency towards size and concentration. Successful companies grow bigger and increasingly dominate their markets. That is understandable. If you're an ambitious entrepreneur, your ambition must be to dominate your market and to gain the pricing power which comes with it. Both Marx and Schumpeter understood this. Marx rejoiced, in a way, because he believed that the rapacious behavior of the dominant capitalists would lead eventually to the revolution and the over overthrow of capitalism itself. Schumpeter lamented it for the same reason as Marx welcomed it. Schumpeter, uh, for Schumpeter, corporatism was not true capitalism. True capitalism is entrepreneurial, innovative, disruptive. Corporatism is domineering, bureaucratic, bureaucratic and collusive with government. In the last Gilded Age, the dominant capitalists, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Cornelius Vanderbilt, were aggressive and rapacious, and they duly brought down upon themselves the wrath of Theodore Roosevelt. <coughs> Today's corporatism is less rapacious, but more venal. To start with, market concentration is almost seen as a good thing. A business school, we all ingest Michael Porter. In fact, the Michael Porter class was my favorite class on market structure and competitive advantage. Then we all learn to admire Buffett's philosophy about building moats and castles. Then we stand idly by or even applaud when US competition policy allows a duopoly in social media advertising, a quasi-monopoly in search, a duopoly in the rating agency business, a duopoly in beer, local monopolies in telecoms and in health insurance, effective monopolies in airlines. The list is very long, I could go on and on. But the real icing on the cake, the distinctive feature of modern corporatism is regulatory capture, what we call cronyism. Corporations spend $2 billion a year in Washington DC and a billion euros a year in Brussels. These places are cesspits. Corporations spend this money because it is a good investment. The purpose of the spend is to raise entry barriers to their industries, to keep out competitors, to fix pricing, or to win contracts with government. We live in an age of crony capitalism. Davos is its, Davos is its temple. Blair, Clinton, Schroeder, Osborne, Mandelson are its high priests. If business is to regain people's trust and credibility, it needs to realize how much it has been cap become captive to this corrupting orthodoxy. Ladies and gentlemen, last year, Andrew Hoffman endowed INSEAD with the greatest gift in its history to establish the Hoffman Institute. According to the um, uh, press release, and I quote, the Institute will explore issues such as ethics, gender balance, humanitarian operations, social impact, sustainability, tech for good, wealth inequality, and other topics related to the, to the role of business in society. This is a hugely generous gift and a wonderful contribution to INSEAD. Do I agree with the issues that they have chosen to focus on? Well, all of them are important and worthy. But if, I were, if we are not careful, we may still stay trapped in the orthodoxies that I've talked about. 
I think business needs to properly step back and try and address the issues that are leading to the growing gulf in the West between the global, for which you could substitute INSEAD, elites, and large swathes of our home populations. And I would like to touch on three issues, one of which is on the Hoffman Institute list and two are not. So I'm going to start with one that is, which is virtue and ethics. The founding fathers of the American Constitution were not content with writing an extraordinary document which set a framework for government which could even withstand Donald Trump. They also spent much time, as recorded in the Federalist Papers, debating the virtues needed to vouchsafe good government. As John Adams said, the only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. And if this cannot be inspired into our people in a greater measure than they have it now, they may change their rulers and the forms of government, but they will not obtain a lasting liberty. The same could be said for business. You can construct exemplary codes of corporate governance or principles of responsible investing or sustainable development goals, but unless business leaders are guided and animated by virtue, it may not get you very far. So how on earth do you guide or animate virtue? <coughs> well, like I said earlier in relation to economic theory, I think we need to go far, quite far upstream. We are all, wittingly or unwittingly, quite heavily influenced by the ethical foundations of our society. The problem we have is that in the last 200 years, those foundations have been heavily shaken. A Christian foundation has been displaced, displaced by a utilitarian or Rawlsian orthodoxy, which is overwhelmingly materialistic in its calculus, which places rights above responsibilities and emphasizes the individual over the community. We have also acquired a certain enlightenment arrogance. If you believe, like the framers of the US Constitution, that all men and women are created equal and, quote unquote, endowed by their creator, that is going to make you inherently modest about what you think you are personally entitled to. Even if you think you work harder than others, and even that you are brighter, you still have this lingering thought that you are fortunate to be endowed by your creator with these gifts of intelligence and hard work. In a post-Christian age, we have no break on our sense of entitlement. As Dostoevsky anticipated, and John Gray has recently restated, Atheism can be, can be, a project of human self-deification. We cannot necessarily turn the clock back to a Christian age, but we can perhaps re-engage with our theory of man, and in particular with the principle of fallibility. The principle of fallibility can pertain whether you, whatever your deeper belief system, because it is so rooted in all our experiences. People have great gifts, but we are also, all of us, extremely fallible. We are capable of rationality, but we are essentially irrational. We are capable of soaring heights of creativity, but in the words of the prophet, we all shit the same shit. The people who meet in Davos have passed more exam exams than other members of the population. They may also be more hardworking, but they are self-interested like everyone else, like all of us. Their creed, their orthodoxy, is a self-serving one. Of course, it helps if you, are in you, are, if you believe you are, we are all endowed by a creator. This is likely to make you much more modest about your entitlements. Jamie Dimon, and I'm sorry to pick on him, um, I've got nothing against him, may think he deserves to be paid 500 times the average US worker. But I wonder how he justifies the fact that the entrepreneur who founded his bank the entrepreneur who founded his bank, a lifelong Episcopalian called J.P. Morgan, thought that the ratio should never go above 20 to 1. My second great theme um, uh, that I want to challenge, which is not in the Hoffman uh, agenda, is the importance and dignity of work. Here too, I, I draw on Christian thinking, specifically Catholic social thinking. The first great statement on the dignity of labor was the papal, encyclical, Rerum Novarum, 
in 1891. Rerum Novarum was published as the church was trying to come to terms with the huge explosion of wealth at the end of the 19th century, with the disruption to urban and rural life, and with the rising inequality caused by industrialization. It rejected socialism, but it sought answers in the mutual duties between labor and capital, as well as between government and its citizens. Of primary concern to the church was the need for some improvement to what it called the misery and wretchedness pressing so unjustly on the majority of the working class. The prevailing orthodoxy of the last 30 years has been that labor is essentially no more than a cost to be managed. The role of management is to minimize costs and maximize productivity. The, work, the workforce are only provisionally part of the community of the company. They are expendable. At Netflix, managers are told to apply a keeper test, and I apologize if anybody works for Netflix, a keeper test to their staff, to their staff asking themselves whether they would fight to keep a given employee. If managers don't fire people, whistleblowers say, they risk being fired themselves. Conditions are even worse at Amazon. According to a 20-something who worked with, at their warehouse in Rugeley uh, about a year ago, I, I quote, every job as a picker or packer in the warehouse was temporary and lasted for nine months, providing little stability. Be under no illusions, this is a temporary job, we were informed on the first day. And despite being the biggest employer in the town, few local people worked at Amazon. Instead, the warehouse relied on an army of Romanians, bust in predominantly from neighboring areas, apparently the only people economically desperate enough to put up with the work Victorian working conditions. In January, I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to be invited to attend a conference call between business leaders and government ministers led by Philip Hammond to brief business after May's first botched deal was, was voted down. It was a dreadful call, uh, really a lobbying exercise by the CBI and big business on which all of them decried Brexit. After the call, a journalist wrote the following. One of the chief executives on that call once told me that when he needs extra staff for warehouses, he recruits direct from Poland. His logic is depressingly clear. It is a pain to look for Brits, to train the long-term unemployed and cope with the higher dropout rates. Over the years, British business has come to rely on imported labor rather than investing in machinery and skills. They ought not to be blamed for this. They are just responding to the system. Brexit was a vote to change the system. We have lost our sense of the dignity of work. In the 19th century, the dignity of work was considered so important that it was a centerpiece of this papal encyclical. Today, trade unions have been emasculated. Guilds barely exist. How do we restore it? Well, I'm certainly not advocating a return to beer and sandwiches at number 10, nor an adoption, uh, for this country at least, of the German dual board structure. But I do think that business schools need to teach the dignity of work, the responsibilities of business leaders to their workforce and to the training and development of their people. We also need to think much more deeply about the nature and choice of corporate entities. What are the merits and demerits of a joint stock company? What are the responsibilities which come with what you might call the exorbitant privilege of limited liability? something which, when it was introduced in 1855, was a source of great controversy because of the way it removed risk and therefore responsibility from company managements. Why are there not more partnerships or mutual societies? What other company forms would give more protection to workers and more sense of mutuality? Western societies also need to have a much deeper conversation about wage disparity and inequality. Are we valuing work correctly? What is the justification for the disparities that have emerged between white collar management and the rest? Are they justified? Or will we want come to look back on them on, on this time as an egregious anomaly? The third theme, also not on the Hoffman Institute list, is community. People often talk about the great philanthropists of the 19th century and why they were in a different 
class from today's breed of philanthropists. In some ways, they were. If you look at arguably the three greatest British industrial philanthropists of that era, they had a surprising amount in common. Joseph Rowntree, the founder of the chocolate firm, was a visionary Quaker and social reformer. He, beat, he built New Earswick, a village in York, for people on low incomes, including staff who worked in his factory, giving them access to decent homes at affordable rents. George Cadbury, the son of the other great chocolate magnate, in turn set up Bourneville Estate near Birmingham. He famously said, if each man could have his own house, a large garden to cultivate, and healthy surroundings, then I thought there will be for them a better opportunity of a happy life. This hardly sounds like Jeff Bezos. <laughs> William Lever, the founder of Lever Brothers, which went on to become Unilever, which is Paul Pullman's company, bought 56 acres of land in the Wirral in Cheshire, and the site became Port Sunlight, where he built his plant and a model village to house its employees. During the First World War, when many of his employees went to fight, he paid uh, the, 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 for the livelihood of all of their families and children while they were away. 30,000 people came to his funeral. The care that Roundtree, Cadbury and Lever took for their community went well beyond the conventional or Friedmanite conception of the firm. And we need to think carefully about the definition of a firm's community and the responsibilities of a firm to its community in the 21st century. Of course, the challenges today are much greater. In an era of global supply chains, who is Tim Cook's, or should I say Tim Apple's, community? <laughs> the designers in London, the chip makers in Taiwan, the screen makers in Korea, the handset makers in China. The problem of scoping a firm's responsibility for its community is much more complex today than it has ever been. But that does not mean we should opt out. I would say that Tim Cook has responsibility in a way for each of these communities and for all the families of his employees worldwide. If business is to be a true force for good, it needs to think about how it interacts with its global community. And that means each business with each of its communities. Man is a deeply social being who needs community and many of our communities are being uprooted. This must be a concern for us all and I hope it will be on the agenda of the Hoffman Institute. Interestingly, Raghuram Rajan, the former governor of the Central Bank of India, has just published a book called The Third Pillar about rediscovering the importance of the community. The book is subtitled how markets and the state leave the community behind. Rajan is one of the few people in the central bank community who seems to be able to think outside his echo chamber. He has questioned the role of QE uh, in fostering inequality, and he also anticipated the 2008 financial crisis. We need more people of his stature and more people within his and our world to be asking these difficult questions. I sense that that conversation is just beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, we live at a time of great change. The change brought about by global capitalism has never been so extensive, the speed of progress never so fast. I'm a great believer in the benefits of markets and of free trade and the laws of comparative advantage and the division of labor which lie behind them. But free trade brings with it dislocation and disruption. The votes for Brexit and Donald Trump show that we need to find a new settlement which, which reconciles these different challenges. Business schools must play their part. As Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. We need to re-examine the theories of change which we teach our MBAs, re-examine our theory of man, our theory of the company, our theories of ownership, and shareholder accountability, our theory of work, and our theory of community. This is an urgent project. As Tucker Carlson said on the cover of his surprising, I don't know how many of you know Tucker Carlson, he's 
uh, Fox Anchorman, but he's written a remarkable book called Ship of Fools. And, and it's about, the most interesting bit is about capitalism. And he says on the cover of the book, a selfish ruling class is bringing America to the brink of revolution. Business school graduates are at the heart of that ruling class. Thank you.